Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Happy Sabbath. I've got to eat it. Yes, we got to hear you. Is this any better? Okay. Well, why don't we open with a word of prayer? Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for a wonderful Sabbath you've given us. What a beautiful morning. Even though the sun's not out, it's nice and cool. It reminds us, though, of your care that you provide us, your covering. So, Lord, as we open up your word and we discuss your the messages you've given us, we ask that your spirit be upon us. Um, let us learn of you and learn who you are so that um, we may know you and ultimately that you may know us. We thank you, Father, in Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> so our subject today is ministering like Jesus. And... Um, I want to take those last two words, like Jesus, and I want to show you show you a picture here, and I want you to ask me who you think this is. So I'll walk it around a little bit. Don't know if you can see this picture. Who is this a picture of? But who is Jesus? I'd like you to take out your Bibles. Turn to Isaiah 52.1. Would somebody like to start reading for me? Isaiah 52, verse 1. Go ahead. Just keep reading. I'll tell you soon to stop. I'm sorry, I moved to verse 13. No, I'm sorry. I've got the wrong chapter. Isaiah 53, I apologize. Verse 1. Sorry. Okay, that's good. So that picture of Jesus I showed you, or was it a picture of Jesus that, that I showed you? 
Was it a representation? You all seem to think it was a picture of Jesus, but that picture is somebody that probably a lot of the, lot of the ladies would have liked to marry, right? In terms of the looks, good looking, ruddy, strong. But was that the picture that was painted for us in Scripture of who Jesus is? Right. So, um, we're going to be a little challenged, or I'm a little challenged with this lesson today. What does it mean to minister like Jesus? So, and that implies in this, in this lesson today that we, um, that we see his characteristics, right? We see who he is. And we want to emulate him. But how is he being portrayed in this lesson to the, this week? And is that the picture of who Jesus is? Is that the picture that God wants us to have of him? In Sabbath's lesson last week, it starts out, Jesus genuinely cared for people. He was more interested in their concerns and needs than his own. His life was totally centered on other people. His was a ministry of loving compassion. Are those things true? Are they correct? He did heal lepers. He opened their blind eyes. He unstopped deaf ears. He delivered demoniacs. He fed the hungry. He cared for the needy. <clears throat> hearts were changed and hearts were touched and lives were changed. Sounds pretty sweet, doesn't it? but we're to minister like Jesus, right? Is that what this, this lesson is about? But why was he ministering? Why was he here? What picture of God was he displaying? So in Sunday's lesson, Jesus always looked for the good in others, right? He always drew out the best in them. That's what the lesson says. Let's look up uh, Matthew 23. And let's start at verse 23. And I'll go ahead and read. I, I like the... Philip's translation, Matthew 23, verse 23. And I want to bring out how Christ looked for always the good in everybody. Alas for you, scribes and Pharisees, you utter frauds, for you pay your tithe on mint and dill and cumin and neglect the things which carry far more weight in the law, justice, mercy, and good faith. These are the things you should have observed without neglecting the others. You're blind leaders, for you filter out a mosquito, yet swallow a camel. You miserable frauds you are, you scribes and Pharisees. You clean the outside of the cup and dish while the inside is full of greed and self-indulgence. Can't you see, Pharisee? First wash the inside of a cup, then you can clean the outside. Alas for you, you hypocritical scribes and Pharisees. You are like whitewashed tombs, look fine on the outside, but are inside are full of dead man's bones and all kinds of rottenness. For you appear like good men on the outside, but inside you are a mass of pretense and wickedness. So did Jesus always look for the good in others? <laughs> what was that? He drew out the best in others?
And how about Matthew 12, 34? You serpents brood, how can you say anything good out of your evil hearts? For a man's words flow out of, his, out of what fills his heart. A good man gives out good from the goodness stored in his heart. A bad man gives out evil from his store of evil. I tell you that men will have to answer at that day of judgment for every careless word they utter. For it is your words that will acquit you and your words that will condemn you. So what I want to challenge you to, to in this conversation today, and I, I want it to be a conversation, um, as we look at this ministry of Christ and that we're to ostensibly emulate, I want to challenge you with what is the ministry of Christ? What was he here for? Was he here to just do good? That too. Was he here to do something else? Really? What happened right after creation? When our first parents ended up wearing fig leaves. They were created to be the king and queen of this world. They had full dominion, and that word is not used lightly. You look in, the, in, in, in law, dominion means authority over. Um, they were given dominion, and what happened at that tree? They forfeited it. They gave it to who? Satan. So Satan has dominion on this world right now. And what did Christ do when he came? When it was his birth? What was that significance of? It was his D-Day, if you know your history. He established a beachhead on this world. And in those 33 years on this world, he was what? He is staking his claim, wasn't he? And his ministry is about what? Revealing God and staking his claim, right? So in his ministry, <clears throat> yes, he was revealing a, a, a minis uh, and his attitude towards people. Certainly, he drew a line, right? Showed a mirror. So Christ was really good at making things black and white. Is that one way you could summarize what you said? And so his, <clears throat> his vitriol, if you want to say, towards their attitudes and towards their positions was in direct contrast to the enslavement that others were having, were experiencing. Even a touch deep in that, to take your metaphor of D-Day, Jesus landed there on the beach, and he's metaphorically fighting his way across the beach and into the country, and riding back the enemy, and he encounters these church leaders, and he said... He said things to them, but I think somebody else mentioned that it was for the benefit of those around him that were siding with him. And he's saying, look at these guys. These guys are dressed up like allies, but they're really enemies. And watch out for these guys. They're, they're, they're infiltrating your camp. And 
So how do you know the difference? You have to know what God is like yourself. So how do we find out who God is? What he's like? What is he really like? God is love. You have to take in the whole Bible in, in context of you know, the, the history and kind of see what the situations were when God speaks and how he reacts to different situations and that's how we learn what he's like. I like the idea God, that... God is both a loving and vengeful. He's vengeful to those who will do wrong to those who, who are trying to teach the truth and will show loving kindness to those who are trying all out to show what his true uh, walk for this earth and for the people on it are. I like the idea that I mean, so many times we hear um, Jesus <coughs> meek, kind, loving, serving, you know, so we're supposed to be all of these things, but here it tells us we don't have to lay down and take bad stuff. We don't have, you know, our job is not just to be kind and loving to people, but we're supposed to stand up for what's right and, and face what's wrong and try to do something about it. I'm going to defend this, the, the Sadducees and Pharisees a little bit here. Not too much. The pastor's advocate, is that what you said, Barry? <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> what was their history? The Jews' history. So they're, 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 the context right now is they're sitting in <clears throat> occupied Israel, right? The Romans have their jackboot on their throat, so to speak. Why were they there? What did their history tell them why they were there? They had, they had been occupied. They had the glory days of Solomon, glory days of King David, <clears throat> and then they went into apostasy. And is in that in apostasy that they went down and down and down, and finally God said, enough. You're going into captivity. So they went into captivity. The Babylonians took them over. Then the Persians... And they finally got back to Jerusalem. <clears throat> and they're admonished, don't go back to your old ways. Right? Keep the Sabbath. Put a hedge around it. Boy, did they build a hedge, didn't they? Was it over 600 rules or something for Sabbath keeping? I'll start with Nehemiah. <clears throat> right. So the Pharisees and Sadducees are longing for the Messiah to come, longing for their place in history to be what they thought it was to be. And here they're seeing <clears throat> a rabble-rouser come who's hanging out with sinners and reprobates and gluttons and drunkards, right? That's our lovely Jesus. Doesn't dress well. And they're trying to protect... Israel from going back to captivity or to get out of captivity. But in their <clears throat> zeal, and I think their zeal was um, well-intentioned, but it was still wrong. And it was so wrong that Christ called, him, called them broods of vipers and snakes and so <clears throat> Eat veggie meat. 
be that no, that's not about their cliches. And then, and then we can compare them to the list of our cliches. You know, Jesus is loving and he's kind. He's this, that, and the other. Are, are all, all of our cliches that we use. I mean, listen to any Sab school class in the, in the world, and you're going to get our list of cliches. And then we've got theirs, and I've got ours. But are we any really different when it comes to knowing God? Probably not. They just hang out at Beth Israel's congregation synagogue. <coughs> My wife, Tim Steinhoff, a rabbi. Very pretty woman. And I wanted to really doubt her, but she was divorced, so I can't believe she was divorced. They're very cool people, but they keep the law. You know? I used to run the, the church in Long Island, but I was hanging out with them. They're pretty cool people. <coughs> New York, and the Christians. <coughs> Yeah. So let, I want to get back to what Barry was talking about here, if I could. So how do we know God? How do we know we know the right God? Is it just study? So there's in Matthew uh, 25, verse 31, talking about the sheep and the goats. <clears throat> but when the Son of Man comes in his splendor with all his angels with him, then he will take his seat on his glorious throne. So he established that beachhead and we're promised here that he's going to come and establish his throne here on this earth, isn't he? All the nations will be assembled before him, and he will separate men from each other like a shepherd separating sheep from goats. He will place the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who have won my father's blessing, take your inheritance. The kingdom reserved for you since the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you made me welcome. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was ill, and you came and looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to see me there. <clears throat> then the true man will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and give you food? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and make you welcome, or see you naked and clothe you, or see you ill or in prison and go to see you? And the king will reply, I assure you, that whatever you did for the humblest of my brothers, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Out of my presence, cursed as you are, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you never made me welcome. When I was naked, you did nothing to clothe me. When I was sick and in prison, you never cared to visit me. Then they too will answer him, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and fail to look after you? Then the king will answer them with these words, I assure you that whatever you fail to do to the humblest of my brothers, you failed to do to me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the true men to eternal life. <clears throat> 
So is it in what we do? How we treat each other? I think that's part of it. Right? I'll agree with you. But let's look at, Ma at Matthew uh, chapter 7, uh, verses 21 through 23, if somebody would like to read that for me. <clears throat> So we've got basically, I think from Luke's, uh, Matthew 7 to Matthew 25, we I think we can say we've got two groups of people, the sheep and the goats, and they're basically doing the same thing, aren't they? They're both ministering like Jesus. So what's the difference? I think we need to deep, do a little deeper dive into what Alan was talking about. How does, is it, is, what is it that is the difference? You know, we, there, there's also the, the, the parable of the, uh, the, the ten virgins. <clears throat> well, ten virgins, five of them, they were all prepared and they were all sleeping, right? That's right. And, and I think the challenge with that is 
that we can't give Jesus our heart that way. We have to give him permission, but he's, he has to change that heart for us. And, and that's something we, that's the miraculous piece. That, and there's, Sally? So there's the scripture that says, by beholding you become changed, right? What happens if you behold a beautiful but incorrect picture of Christ? So we can read it or I could just paraphrase it. Let me just paraphrase it for time's sake. The parable that Christ told of the... The talents, the three servants. So he had two servants that were given some, some money, and they immediately went off and did something with it. The third servant, who was ostensibly wicked, went off and buried his talents. I've really struggled. I've always hated this, ser this, this parable because, uh, you know, it says, you know, as, as we have, as I've grown up, it's, oh, you got to, you know, use your talents, you know, for the Lord. Use, you, use them wisely. And something always was is incongruous with, with that conclusion of that story um, to me. And then it dawned on me when I actually read the story. <laughs> um, and let me read it for you. Um, so this is when the, the, the last servant, the unfaithful servant, <clears throat> comes and, and gives his account to the master. Then the man who had received the 1,000 pounds came in and said, Sir, I always knew you were a hard man, reaping where you never sowed and collecting where you never laid out. So I was scared, and I went off and hid your 1,000 pounds in the ground. Here is your money intact. You are a wicked, lazy servant, his master told him. You say you knew that I reap where I never sowed and collect where I never laid out then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and when I came, I should at any rate have received what belongs to me with interest. Do you notice the nuance in that story? The servant believed his master to be one thing, and he acted in accordance with his belief of that master. But what we do know in the previous two occurrences with the other two servants that his master was a, was a good man. So what do you know about God? Well, what you're saying is the first two believed he was a good master, therefore they acted in accordance that way. And the third one believed he was a bad guy, and he also acted in accordance with his belief. So that's, that's yeah, as Proverbs says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Right? With that conclusion, how did, why, does the, uh, why does Jesus respond with, if you knew I was this way, did you not put your money into a bank that I at least have interest? When, isn't he saying that if, if you think, think I'm this way, then you should have done something different? And what's his accusation? He says, you wicked and lazy servant. So there's two things. One, he was wicked in his, in his thoughts of who this master was. And two, on, on top of that, he was lazy. He didn't even act on it. And so, when we think about ministering to others, ministering comes from our heart. I'll agree with that. comes from who we are inside. But who we are, as Scripture says, the heart of man is evil, evil continually. The only way we can serve as Christ served is to first 
look at the master and see who the master really is. And I think that's one of the admonitions in the Ten Commandments. Do not create an image of me. God says, let me tell you who I am. Don't let others tell you who I am. Let me explain who I am. And when you see me, if you don't say anything, even the most inanimate object I have created, a rock, will glorify me. Are you a rock? Are you living under a rock? Take time to observe God. See who he is, as he says. Taste and see that I am good. And when you see that, surrender. Very good. And once that happens, you will find your ministry flow out without having to be admonished to go minister. And yes, you can see the ministry examples and say, am I ministering? Well, I don't know. I don't think the people who God said at the end, my good and faithful servants, really were worrying about how they were ministering to others. So seek God and you will live.